<laughs> All right, welcome everybody to the 2021. Uh, everyone's still alive and well, it looks like January 4th, as we start this uh, next crazy year and hope that it goes a little bit better than the last. So um, at least uh, here in Newport, uh, January 1st means frostbiting starts, uh, well, for at least the latecomers at Newport Yacht Club, um, which I joined last year and had a great time. So this year we, we've had the ranks um, improve with the, the uh, arrival of Amanda Callahan. Everybody know this outstanding uh, sailor. She's the head coach at Roger Williams University. And she's cleaning up in the fleet, which is, uh, is awesome to see. So um, I'll do a quick share here. So here is a quick look at the B fleet. So remember there's uh, A and B uh, at the Newport Yacht Club here. Can you see that okay? And this is the B fleet start, a quick look. Uh, you can tell it's a lovely winter day here. The snow didn't come until the end and a nice little northeasterly and uh, these beautiful boats called turnabouts or N10s, um, just pure speed machines. And uh, this is how the B fleet start goes. There we go, that's 30 seconds. There you go. Dave, are those personal boats or are they owned by the club? So these are all owned by, by the club. You show up, put the sails up and go. Nice. Yeah. I like this little uh, port attack approach here, looking for a spot. That's uh, Paul Fleming, if anybody you know him. So number four here, she uh, went on to win the day in the B fleet. Uh, yeah, nice, clean, beautiful. well clear. Anyway, so that, that was a bit of the action uh, for, for us here. And do, do you combine the scores of an A fleet and a B fleet, or are they just two independent uh, classes? Uh, two independent groups, and based on your scores, you move up and down through the fleet. So uh, for the top half of the B fleet there, they'll, they'll go to A, and people can get bumped around based on uh, if you have a really bad week, you find yourself in the, the back of the – but it helps you sort of get your scores back up a little bit. But anyway, man, it was just nice to be on the water anyway. Just you really do kind of forget about everything. So um, anyway, how about you guys? What, um, what was your, your uh, holiday action? Anything good? <laughs> You, Gary. <laughs> uh, it was good. You know, we, we have five grandkids, and it's such a joy to take the older ones out. And on Saturday, two days ago, we went out uh, sailing. It started out an, an easy day, eight, nine knots, and uh, it was by the end, it was blowing 25. But we'd gone a long way downwind, so it was quite an exciting sail upwind. And they, the young guys, I mean, they really got into it. Four years old, seven years old, and nine years old. And uh, you know, not a care in the world. And luckily we had all the correct clothes on it. We visited a couple lighthouses, you know, the big excitement when you get to go around a lighthouse. And anyway, it, it was, it was just refreshing. It was about 47 degrees out. So not too cold. It was probably colder, uh, for you sailing up in Newport last weekend. But anyway, that was kind of the highlight of the Christmas, having a good long sail going out 930 on Saturday morning and coming in at for the four o'clock bridge. Excellent. Right. Good to keep playing. Good. All right, Chris, you're up. We haven't seen you in a while. Where have you been? Right. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> good, good point. Uh, I actually, my wife and I actually are just back from spending about six weeks in uh, New England, uh, which you might think is a crazy move for somebody who lives in San Diego. Um, but we just wanted to get a little bit of a change of scenery and uh, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of people around here. So looking for a little distance, but, uh, it, it was actually a, a great thing to go back and visit my old haunts. And, uh, we're now back in San Diego and, uh, there is some sailing happening here. We had a, a nice new year's day race. Um, unfortunately the wind didn't really cooperate, but there were a lot of people out sailing uh, PHRF and this coming weekend we have a, uh, semi long distance race. It's a day race that starts uh, about 11 in the morning, goes out around the Coronado Islands and back. And then in the middle of the month, we have uh, a regular um, San Diego Yacht Club One Design weekend that looks like it's gonna get uh, a pretty good turnout with the Etchell's fleet. So stuff, lots of stuff to look forward to. Very cool. Yeah, so rel relatively normal, but you know, not. <laughs> So what are you sailing out? Are you are you doing the hot room or what, what's uh, what's the hot boat that you, you you want to get on this year? 
So the boat I'm going to sail on is a uh, Soto 40. And I'm looking to do a bunch of sailing with them in the spring and um, perhaps the Cabo race. So we will, uh, this is the fir first time out with them on Saturday. So I'm looking forward to it. And awesome. then we're hoping uh, all points, uh, all things are pointing to having the Etchells North Americans here in, uh, I think, May. And so that will be, you know, hopefully the stars will line up and we can actually, you know, go do some normal sailing. Um, and I think that'll be really good for the local activity. Our fleet is actually getting stronger and stronger, uh, you know, a lot more kind of grassroots type sailors joining it, which is healthy. And um, so that's, that's all good. So look, looking forward to that. The, uh, the, the good, a good etchels is uh, good or easy to, to find or hard to find these days or, or easy? Uh, I mean, they, they're hard to find, you know, a really good one. But, um, you know, we have a, a nice group of people, you know, you can get a you can get a decent boat for, you know, 15 to 20,000, which is, you know, uh, not too bad. And um, there are some of those boats available. Yeah, he said it was. All right, cool. Uh, well, Isla, you're in the same neck of the woods. I've, based on your Facebook uh, activity, you've been off playing on the playing on the range and back, back in the hood. Yeah, yeah, I've been been confined here in San Diego with my horses and we got a bit of snow over the holidays so we took them up and just had a glorious New Year's Eve ride and since Gary mentioned his family I'm uh, proudly following in his footsteps and Marley and her uh. now fiance Graham Landy called me up over the holidays and announced they were going to get married at some point down the road so that's pretty cool number one going down there and I'll be uh, trying to stay ahead of Chris this coming weekend, sailing on the Piwak at Volvo 70 in that race <laughs> around the islands if they don't cancel it. <laughs> more, more Bulldogs on the way. So what are the, on the, on the Piwak, it, um, what, what's, what's the setup on the boat or what's, what's new with, with that to uh, bring it up to speed? Oh, uh, that, that was a new boat that was, you know, targeted to do the tra uh, Transpac first to finish. You know, Roy's still got his uh, sled, the Andrew 70, um, and that, but um, when things changed lot, two years ago, they didn't sail it, so it really hasn't been sailed much, but it's a new boat for the team, and got a, um, it's a really cool challenge. It's, it's the old Blackjack, which was, Map, maybe Jonathan even knows, Map, the, uh, they, uh, like, Alba Medica, maybe it's, and it's a uh, turbocharged, long, deep keel, big rig and uh, Juan K design. And it'll be a, a really fun challenge for us uh, sled sailors to try to figure out. <laughs> a lot of moving parts. Yeah, all push button. No, you know, uh, I tried to put a handle in, we're doing the cowls on the, on the uh, rams and the load cells and everything. And I tried to put the handle in to grind up the runner to pull the uh, deflectors out. And I couldn't even figure out how to put the winch handle in the winch. I mean, they're not made to be ground up by hand. Oh, Danny. All right, so uh, how about you, Jonathan? What have you been up to? Yeah, it's been kind of a quiet um, Christmas here, but um, yeah, it's just been raining and cold. <laughs> Got up skiing one day, so that was great. Uh, did manage to go arrow frostbiting yesterday um, it was pretty sporty, uh, pretty windy and pretty cold, but it stopped raining for a while. So, uh, I got schooled again, but <laughs> anyways, it's good fun. And you feel so good afterwards, even though it's hard to motivate yourself to go after you come back, you're like, man, that was great. Mm. So, so are you that, feeling that the, the arrow has the three rig choices? Are you, uh, in the big rig or what's what's um yeah we change depending on the condition so yesterday was the seven rig and then light air we use a nine rig and it, everybody's bought uh multiple sales yep no, that's cool so who's going yeah, so it's pretty cool in light air like you're fully juiced up with that nine rig and the seven rig it's basically like a laser rig so you know sort of 12 to 25 is, is good for that and who is schooling you um the usual people uh dalton bergen's 
and Carl Bucken are probably the top two and usually Jay Renahan as well, but he, he just had foot surgery. Um, there's a couple other pretty good guys in our fleet as well. Mm-hmm. So interesting, Carl and Bergen and um, Dalton are um, father-in-law, son-in-law. <laughs> and so despite the age difference of 30 years, that they're, they're probably the top two in our fleet. That's amazing. Uh, on your post personal post race debriefs, what are you finding is the difference? Well, what's, what's nagging at you? Uh, it's largely about fitness. You know, those guys, um, the guys that are good can just hike, hike hard and keep doing it all day. And I can hike for a little while, but, um, so that's what I need to work on. There you go. It's pretty There's obvious, but, but it's not that simple to cure. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have a spare hiking bench for Jonathan? You're not using <laughs> And downwind technique as well, I would say, you know, the good guys are so good downwind and, and that's something that I've been working on and I've gotten a little better at, but still a ways to go. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Less, uh, more angle sailing or, or straight downwind with these boats. Yeah. The arrow is so light that you can actually reach up and, you know, you can do a lot of different courses and, and have it work out much more so than a laser. Mm. There's a, there's a more variety of, of, uh, angles downwind and the boat is so light you know the kinetics and just the heel angle and everything is is really critical all right well good luck with that fitness goal uh we, we, we can check them in the every week or, or you can just we'll check them in the end of the year how's that okay maybe that's more reasonable <laughs> uh so uh, uh ed what have you been doing and, and maybe give us some insight on to uh what happens in these massive gaps in, down in auckland it's definitely gone quiet. I know a lot of the guys went off and took their little vacations and explored New Zealand and, you know, the boat guys are there playing away. Uh, but uh, what, what typically happens when you have a big, long break like this? Yeah, well, uh, a couple of things. First of all, Happy New Year, everybody. Congratulations to Marley and, uh, and the Eisler Group or, you know, a, a new uh, partner coming into the fold there. Um, go Graham, go, go Yale and all that stuff. Um, We've been doing, uh, you know, a, a little bit of uh, canal sailing with our remote control boats that you talked us into a few months ago. And um, it's kind of fun because the neighbors on each side of the canal are starting to, to um, you know, get little betting pools going and stuff. And, and they, they're all come out on their dock and watch and have fun. And so we're, we've been enjoying that. But now it's time for things to start heating up again. You know, we, we've been, um, of course, uh, Florida weather starts to get really wonderful this time of year and in the 70 to 80 degree weather we've had for the past 10 days there's been a lot of people out on their boats um, and we have a lot of events coming up J70s this weekend uh, the J Fest event uh, the weekend after that weekend after that there's a big uh, kiteboard uh, foiling kiteboard uh, event that's going to be here uh, the snipes come down for the winter um, you know there's a bunch of stuff going on now it all starts cranking up and even though the clubs are being a bit sensitive to all that, uh, people are still coming. Even if they, even if the club isn't officially running a race, people are still coming here and having races. You're using the robotic marks. They, you don't have to have a big race committee by doing that. And they get enough people out to have 20, 25 boats and, and go have a good time. So it's fun to see. Um, down in Auckland, uh, as we said, uh, you know, last year, the, the, um, uh, all the teams would have had a plan for what they were going to do in between that Christmas event and then the first part of the product cup, uh, which is next week now. And, um, you know, they all had a plan. How much did those plans get modified is the real question. We saw the uh, Lunarosa team just come out with, uh, uh, you know, a, quite a change in how their fairings are, are done on board to, to uh, model uh, or copy a little bit what uh, Team New Zealand has. Um, you know, and everybody's refining, everybody's changing things around. The English, of course, have got a, a big task to try and come forward uh, from where they were in those races. And um, I think they've been, they've been working hard on underwater foils and, and looking for ways to power up, uh, up in their sail plan. Um, but I think, you know, one of the things we talked about last time we were on here doing this was uh, just, you know, there's got to be a lot of gain up in the air inside the, the mainsail, especially. There's just, there's some stuff going on up in there that, you know, that so far New Zealand's got that right. And if the other guys can uh, find ways to, to, you know, effectively change and control their power better, 
uh, up in those sales, I think that's where you're going to find differences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the magic between the skins, I think, with, you know, is what's yeah. uh, hard to see. But what do you think, guys? Sir? What's, uh, you know, based on what you saw, what would you be doing now if you were in, in and amongst one of those camps? I, I saw a fascinating thing uh, the other day about uh, that was put on by one of the, the sail making teams. I think it was Quantum on uh, the what how the Brits really aren't as far behind and screwed as they appeared to be. And it was a fascinating presentation and it, and it focused on the, the classic lift to drag of, you know, how the boats are flying. And if you, you know, change your rudder angle, we need Taylor here for this or a foiler, but um, if you change your rudder flap, you can change the pitch of your hull. And that uh, changes the pitch of your, um, your main foils. Uh, which can be done a little bit, you know, with the trim tab, but the, the main angle of attack is, is driven by how the boat sits. And I hadn't really thought about that that much, but their point was, hey, the Brit spoils don't look that much different. And what, what looked different was the way they were flying. And probably they were just realized that they basically had their, their primary foil at the wrong angle compared to the hull and they need to change that which would mean a huge boat construction job uh, along with all the other details that go into it so uh, that was fascinating and something i'm going to be looking for once the racing starts which i can't wait for but i'd, lo I'd love to be you know in the in the uh, watering holes and a little bit closer into what what the skinny is and what the teams are doing because it's 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 an, a fascinating game and it's all out there, or a lot of it, not, not behind the inside the skins of the mains, but a lot of it's out there for us to see if we're perceptive enough. Hmm. All right, anybody else want to weigh in on that one, Jonathan? Cash. <laughs> I mean, I, the, this next round is so interesting to me because they all race each other uh, four times, you know, four times double. So you get eight races and then one gets a buy, goes forward and the other two race. Of course, it's more convenient to get the buy and continue on. But on the other hand, uh, there's real racing going on and there's been so limited. It just makes me wonder if the two that are second and third and don't have the buy ended up stronger at the end than the one that gets the buy. And of course, New Zealand sitting on the sideline watching uh, it'll be killing them to not be out racing and seeing the other guys uh, making these incremental improvements. So it's a fascinating set of trials coming up, very unique in the America's Cup. And uh, we'll all be smart after it's all over, but I just wonder if the buy really helps you or not. Mm. All right, could be buy or buy buy. All right, the other big, <laughs> uh, I guess the other, I mean, is the Von David can't ignore that. So let's just check in there. I guess we'll, we'll, we'll sneak a view of the, the overall look at it. Um, what is quite amazing is the gap between, uh, you know, uh, group one and group two is uh, substantial. But what do you think, Jonathan? Or uh, I saw you guys want to chip in on what's, what's happening here based on um, Thomas's what looks like a smart shortcut. <laughs> I'll, I'll give my unscientific view and then uh, Peter can come back with something that's actually based on real weather. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think it's, it's, for me, it's been so fun to watch not only the competitive aspect of it, but also the human drama. Um, you know, if you go to the Vonde website and just listen to some of the interviews of the sailors and stuff, it's, it's pretty amazing and um, kind of just highlights what the, what the race is all about. Um, you can see from this graphic how close the racing is on, on what they're calling the Peloton. You know, those boats five through 12 are all within, you know, 150 miles with 7,000 miles to go, you know, so it's all on. And even the boats at the front, um, as you can see with the current weather, they're about to come into a very uh, challenging um, weather picture, which it often is in that part of the world. But this time, even more so, you can see there's a giant high pressure that's developing right in front of them. And you can see the linked out guy, uh, Thomas Rayant, is sort of trying to cut the corner, potentially going inside the Falklands. Maybe he's going to pick up the next low that comes off South America. The two leaders are trying to stay further to the east, trying to stay in the old wind. Um, 
So it's it's going to be pretty interesting to see what happens in the next week. And it could be one of those things where you make your bet and you're not going to know if it's the right one for six or seven more days. Mm, that's big. All right, nicely. Did you run the routing yet, or what's um, what do you think is going to happen? I guess I guess I'll have to I'll have to do it as soon as this is over and then share it with you. But it, <laughs> you know, you, Jonathan's absolutely right. I mean, with this much separation, and obviously Thomas is trying the inside of the Falklands route, which traditionally I don't believe is the classic way to do an around the world race because you're still making great BMG if you stay outside and, you know, that's this is the uh, Southern Ocean's nice westerlies for as long as you can. Mm -hmm. But it all, you know, it's all setting up not only the passage of that high, that blue area right there right now, which is transitory, but also the the um, positioning of where you are when you cross the doldrums. You know, 150 miles is nothing in these boats um, or even more. So it'll be fascinating. I'll, I'll, I'll do a routing and uh, shoot it to you later and you can share that. All right, so if, if anybody's gonna lay some money down right now, uh, would, would, you, would you lay it down on it working or not for Thomas? Going inside? Hmm. you know and it could be a situation where he's doing the right thing for the win that he is going to have you know a day later than the other guys and they may be doing the right thing for what they have so um it could just be a function of where you are in the succession of highs and lows but i agree with peter it's a, it's a bit of a risk but hey if you're in third a couple hundred miles back it's the perfect opportunity for something like that. But I agree with Peter too. There's still plenty of opportunities to come, including the doldrums and the whole, the whole South Atlantic looks to be quite complicated. Oh, good stuff. All right. Well, uh, we'll check back next week and see how it played out. Um, I guess that's it for this week. We'll see you guys um, next week. Go oh, well. on. All right, go. The, uh, to speaking of weather and back to America's Cups, uh, my partner, uh, Chris Bedford, has decided he wants to give another free show. And we're going to be doing a preview of the America's Cup season weather in Auckland um, the day before or two days before the, uh, the start of the round robins at Marine Weather U. So that'll be a, another fun free one. And Chris is working hard putting together all of his secrets that all the teams will want to watch. <laughs> But it, it'll be help. I, I think it'll be helpful for people that you know, like us, that are super fans that want to spend five minutes and take a look at the weather before we watch the racing, just to have a little bit better idea of what what's going through everybody's heads and will they foil or won't they foil? Excellent. So the best way to stay on top of that is, uh, I imagine, on Facebook, Marine Weather University, you go like, and you can kind of get the updates on uh, when things are happening there. Yep. All right. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Have a great week. Thank you. And uh, Happy New Year. See you next Hi, time. Happy, Happy New Year. Year. So long. Happy New Year.